Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's live broadcast, Radiology and Disinfection in the Age of COVID-19. I'm Dr. Mahmoud Mosavasha, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's event. We are pleased to bring you this webcast presented by both Diagnostic Imaging and Infection Control today. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions at the end during the Q&A portion of the event. You can also submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I would also like to mention that as part of your commitment to providing, our commitment to providing education to healthcare and industry sciences professionals during the COVID-19 pandemic, attendance at this webinar is free of charge. However, if you'd like to make a donation to help first responders through the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund, MGH, MJH Life Sciences will match all contributions. To make a donation, please click donate below and complete the requested information. I would now like to introduce tonight's speakers. This evening, we are fortunate enough to have three unique perspectives on the impact of COVID-19 in radiology. Tonight's presentations will cover topics in infection control, point of care, and facility management where we'll learn about the latest disinfection protocols for imaging modalities, best practices for managing patient workflow, and tools and technologies that can help keep us operational. We'll also discuss preliminary strategies to help departments and practices emerge from this pandemic. I'm Dr. Mahmoud Mosavasha, Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Washington, where I am Vice Chair of Clinical Operations and Radiology Chief of Service. I'm joined by Dr. Saskia Popescu, an infectious disease epidemiologist and infection preventionist at Honor Health, and Dhruv Chopra, Chief Executive Officer of Collaborative Imaging. Thank you for joining us. We'll begin tonight's presentation with Dr. Popescu. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So today I wanted to speak a little bit about infection prevention and control and the radiology setting, because I think it's very easy to focus on what we call those front lines, the emergency departments, urgent cares, and the COVID-19 units. But this is also an area we really have to account for how we're approaching patient care processes and disinfection. So um, let me just click on the slide, there we go. So when it comes to PPE, I think one of the first questions I always get is, are we using it correctly? Are we doing it um, correctly? Do my staff have the proper care and the proper PPE that they need? So today I had um, a radiology tech come to me and say, I don't have an N95, do I need one? And I think that's a really valid question because as hospitals are dealing with strained personal protective equipment supplies, the focus has really been on how do I make sure I'm a good steward of my resources? How do I really refine who gets an N95 and do they truly need it? Because we're having to engage in extended and reuse per CDC guidelines. So the initial CDC guidelines for um, care of a COVID or a PUI, which is a patient under investigation for COVID, is a gown, gloves, you know, your contact droplet, if you will, but really reinforcing that with eye protection and an N95 if you are in the room or engaging in an aerosol generating procedure with that patient. So the question then becomes, do my, you know, my radiologist, my rad techs, or anybody involved in radiology care require an N95 if they're not going to be in that room. So one process that I encourage people to really consider is do you have, um, are you going to be in the room when that patient is, in, is having an aerosol generating procedure? If not, then you only need a surgical mask. And if you will be in there, then you need an N95. And one thing that we were really struggling with was how do you know if it's been an hour since that aerosol generating procedure? Because part of that is we know there requires about an hour for a, a normal patient room to have enough air exchanges to circulate that air and get rid of any aerosolized um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's like, 
how do I coordinate that? How do I communicate that? Because we know in healthcare, communication can is, is a critical piece, but can easily be something that we fail at. So whether it was writing the time on the room, you know, we actually created little signs that said stop, you know, aerosol generating procedure, um, you know, don't enter the room without an N95 until this time, or eventually it came to the process of designating, um, you know, a certain amount of radiology techs or, or anybody that's going to be going in that room per shift to have N95. So I really encourage people when you're looking at your staffing and your PPE needs to consider workflow. And that's a really challenging piece to this. So you have to make sure anybody that's going to be in the room during aerosol generating procedures or within an hour of them has that N95. Are you doing extended use? Are you using UV disinfection or wherever, you know, whatever disinfection to have extended use of those after the shift? Um, and then also, how comfortable are they with transporting patients? If a patient's going to be taken somewhere for a CT scan, um, is that patient wearing a mask? Because that's the most critical piece to this. And I, you know, it seems simple, but realistically, I think I, you know I've seen in the past, thankfully not for COVID nineteen, where you know we've been moving a patient with tuberculosis and everybody going with them and in the room has an N95 and all of their PPE except the patient. The patient's being moved out of the room. So those are little nuances that we need to account for. Um, in terms of disinfection from, you know, from equipment to surfaces, COVID-19, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, it's an envelope virus. It's not an environmentally hardy organism. And I know it's a novel one and I know it's very scary, but I always remind people this isn't C. diff. This isn't something that's super challenging to kill. You just need to make sure your disinfectants you're using are, have a claim for the EPA um, emerging viral pathogens. We're going to go on the website and find that as I shown this the slide very very easy and i think that's the first step because i always questions from staff saying am i is this going to stay because they think they need something really powerful but that's actually the case you actually you don't need to be using bleach if you have disinfectants that are effective and have that claim you're fine so what are your procedures then for cleaning equipment you know x-ray equipment needed in the emergency department this was actually another question i had today was do I need to wipe down the entire machine? When do I do it? Do I do it in the room? Do I do it when I leave the room? And I, one piece um, it's really important to remember is that people are scared. They are so worried they're gonna get sick or take this home to their family. So some questions that might seem a little over the top or a little overzealous are really meaningful. And it's important to take that time to have those conversations and work through process measures and workflow with people. So today, you know, the question was, once I take the equipment out of the, you know, the PUI, the patient under investigations room in the ED, do I clean it right away? Can I take it down? So we work through some of that. So I encourage them, of course, after every patient use, you should be disinfecting this, but especially you need to be mindful of, are you doing this right outside the room because the last thing you want to do is like wheel it down and be on your way and forget to do it so obviously does your disinfectant have that claim but other considerations i know we've talked about a lot in healthcare are um you know a little bit more enhanced cleaning and that would be uv disinfection are you you know using that in your high risk areas i know our healthcare facility uses that it, and it's not a substitute for your cleaning and disinfection you would be doing regularly but it is a nice way to add that extra layer of cleaning and one thing that i think it's really easy to forget or assume is are your staff comfortable and trained in doing this cleaning it sounds silly but do they, when was the last time that they were taught how to wipe down that machine or which disinfectant to use and how confident and comfortable do they feel with that? Because I think it's so, so easy to just assume, oh, that's part of their job title. I mean, we taught them that when they started. Well, when was the last time we did competencies and they had the opportunity to really demonstrate that they felt comfortable with that process, especially right now. And do you have cleaning logs? I mean, is there is there a certain process that you have in place for every, you know, post patient use? Is that being cleaned and disinfected? So these are little things to keep in mind of. And frankly, questions I've been getting increasingly during the COVID-19 pandemic. So one other piece to this is what PPE should be worn during the cleaning and disinfection. And, you know, I really go back to the notion of treat this as you would a normal isolation room. You know, this isn't something like Ebola that requires a ton of enhanced measures. Um, we know the tools that we have are effective against it. And what PPE would you use when entering and disinfecting that room? It's gonna be the same. You don't need to get into like a Tyvek suit and a papper and everything like that. That's not necessary. The cleaning tools you have are effective. And, you know, realistically, the thing too is wear gloves when you're using them. 
Um, you should be still wearing a mask if you're with that patient or in that room still. All of that PPE is important. So it doesn't require all these additional enhanced measures for cleaning. You just need to be making sure that you're doing it. So when it comes to workflow and process during COVID-19, because I think it's really easy to say, well, this is what you have to do, but how do we actually translate that to practice? So first and foremost, to minimize unnecessary use of PPE, really designating one to two ra you know, radiology techs per shift, I think is really helpful, or looking at your necessary staff. Do you need all of those people in the room? Um, do they require an N95? Are they going to be present for aerosol generating procedures? Are you able, you know, if you have a lot of supplies, can you give them that N95 for the entire day? Because one thing I have seen is, well, we're gonna give everybody an N95 when they go into that room, but then they don't need it the rest of the day. So then they're switching back and forth between an N95 and a surgical mask, which I think can be confusing, but is also wasteful. So if you have staff that you can designate for being involved in the care of COVID-19 patients or those under investigation for COVID-19, then that's a, a better way um, to make sure that they have a little bit more enhanced training or comfort levels with the PPE. Obviously, everybody should be trained in this in case there's an emergency, but it's better just to be a good steward of our resources by designating staff so that they do have those N95s and then they're not having to switch back and forth. They can use that N95 for the entire shift. And then if you are capable of reprocessing it, doing it that way, or at least dispose it, dispose of it unless it gets um, soiled. So if that aerosol generating procedure is going on um, and that room isn't negative pressure, that's why we need that one hour, especially at, you know, at least, you, and obviously you should check your engineering controls, but for the room to kind of clear, the air to clear, you know, the enough air exchanges to occur so that if you do go in that room and you're not wearing an N95, you would be protected. So again, having that signage is really important or having a process in place, whether that means, hey, anybody that goes into these rooms is gonna get an N95, that's fine. You know, our hospital system has done that. I know a lot of other places though are struggling with PPE supplies. So when they're looking at who absolutely gets an N95, that might just be the nurses and the, and the single medical provider for that patient. So how do, you, um, how do you consider all of the other ancillary staff that are critical in that care, but you know, might not be able or might not need to be in that room during that aerosol generating procedure. So kind of consider that whether it's putting a timestamp on the door and letting people know, or if everybody is wearing an N95 involved in that care, then that's that kind of negates that signage, but something to consider nonetheless. So ensure staff have N95s fitted and are trained and extended and reused. This is a novel practice. You know, traditionally, we always told them, you go into the room with the mask, you come out and you throw it in the trash can. <laughs> and this is different. You know, this is an emergency um, use protocol. The CDC and OSHA all provided this for a pandemic situation. But that being said, it's not a normal practice for them. It's something that they have never been asked to do. And we've frankly told them the exact opposite. So be patient with staff and make sure they are comfortable with the safe handling, that safe donning and doffing. And what are they doing with their masks when they're not wearing them? You know, are they throwing them in their scrubs? Because we definitely don't want to be doing that. Are they storing them, you know, in a biohazard bag that can create moisture and would then, um, you know, help degrade the mask filter, which we don't want. So all of these little things need to be accounted for because I think it is important to recognize that we're asking people to do unique practices and in a very stressful time. So we want to make sure that they feel comfortable with them and have the training to be safe. But also now that they're having to use masks for a longer period of time, how um, are they pretty comfortable doing quality checks? Do they know if that mask isn't fitting appropriately anymore? And where are they storing them? So, um, you know, I think this is a really big piece, especially the enhanced PPE. I always remind people, you've worn this PPE before. It's not new to you. It's just a different kind of situation. So going through that and again, being patient, spending the time to make sure staff feel comfortable donning, doffing, and working in that PPE, especially when it's the masks that will be extended use. So when in, do in doubt, I always say, talk to your infection preventionist. That's why we're here. And we are, you know, kind of practice is to problem solve because that's healthcare. But these are situations we're all dealing with. They're all new. You know, we're building the bridge as we walk across it, but know that you are supported and Every healthcare environment is so unique, so it's important to develop processes that mirror CDC guidelines, but that can be followed and fit your facility's needs. So with that being said, um, thank you so much, and I appreciate the chance to talk about infection control. Thank you so much, Dr. Pobescu, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm up next. I'm gonna be talking about radiology preparedness in COVID-19. 
I have no disclosures. So the first topic is the role of imaging in COVID-19 screening. And per the CDC and ACR guidelines, imaging is not routinely relied upon for screening uh, in COVID-19. Per the Fleischner Society guidelines, CT can be used in the setting of limited access to PCR testing or in patients with moderate to severe symptoms. And these moderate to severe symptoms refer to patients with severe significant pulmonary dysfunction or evidence of pulmonary damage, including hypoxia or moderate to severe dyspnea. Uh, and in those patients with high, high pretest probability of disease. Also, patients who are at risk, at high risk of progression of disease due to health factors, which includes age greater than 65, uh, history of diabetes, history of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, immunocompromise, or chronic respiratory disease. Patients with clinical worsening of symptoms can also be uh, imaged in the setting of COVID-19 and in surge settings where rapid results in triage are needed due to high volumes of patient presentations with either COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19. And this scenario played out in New York City, Spain, Italy, and early on in Wuhan. And that should be a consideration in those settings as you face that surge. So next, we talk about when to perform imaging during the COVID-19 crisis. And we've triaged at our institution cases into three categories. The first is critical cases. And this goes outside of this COVID screening or COVID imaging. But um, in critical cases where imaging, imaging is needed urgently for diagnosis and patient management. This includes cases where you know, you're, you're worried about a stroke, you're worried about appendicitis, a hemorrhage, or uh, pulmonary embolism potentially, whether, whether um, uh, you know, in the setting of potential COVID or positive COVID. These really uh, speak to urgent inpatient and ED cases that need imaging that will impact patient management. In addition, the consideration for time-sensitive imaging. You know, this is, um, this is in all cases where a short delay is acceptable, whether it's within one to two weeks, um, these are patients that you can image within that time frame when the imaging is needed. And this applies to a lot of cancer treatment planning and cancer follow-up cases. And then the other exams fall into the non-urgent cases, where these cases can wait months without adverse uh, effect to patient care. Uh, screening exams fall into this category, whether it's lung cancer, mammography, virtual colonoscopy, uh, DEXA scans, and calcium scoring CT. So these are the three categories that we divide up um, outpatient, ED, inpatient cases into and, uh, and image accordingly. So in terms of our elective imaging process, uh, what we've done is we've developed an automated uh, texting system. Uh, and, we, and within this texting system, we encourage patients to reschedule their elective imaging. We suggest that patients communicate with their ordering physicians to determine the time-sensitive nature of the study. Uh, and we provide them with a rescheduling line. The date to restart elective imaging is evaluated on a two-week rolling process just to really reassess the landscape, uh, reassess you know, uh, uh, you know, local governance uh, orders and mandates, um, and determine you know, whether we want to continue this or whether we're getting close to a point to where we can really set, really set that time. In terms of the rescheduling of exams, we have been holding all the exams in a queue, in a kind of backlog queue, uh, which we then reassess periodically to determine which exams are reaching the point where they've been in the backlog and they may be reaching a point where they're uh, reaching a time sensitive uh, uh, kind of a decision making point and we need to start imaging them. In terms of scheduling new patients, uh, on the, uh, what we request from the ordering clinicians is that they place on the uh, exam requisition within the indication sec section, the time sensitivity of the exam, whether it's critical and needs to be done right away, whether it can wait some time period and how long can it wait? Does this imaging need to be done within a week, within two weeks, within a month, um, so on and so forth, you know, so that we can uh, uh, plan accordingly. And the reason why we really engage patients and their ordering physicians is because they're the ones that best know the time sensitive nature of the study. It's really difficult for radiologists to determine this uh, based on, um, based on uh, you know, a one-line history uh, within the order of the exam. 
And here's a, a, a schematic of our uh, image. on the left. Uh, generally, you try to image portably when possible. Um, and this really does apply both to COVID-19 positive and suspected patients. But in addition for inpatients, if you can image portably in order to reduce that traffic, uh, the congestion within the radiology department, and the potential exposures uh, for patients, that's, that's very valuable. You should always take appropriate precautions um, and, uh, and uh, and we'll discuss these in a little a little later and really focus on imaging that will change management. And in terms of our procedures, we have categorized uh, procedures into three categories, one, two, and three. Uh, uh, procedures that go into category one are elective non-urgent, and these are, if delayed, will not harm patients in the next two to six months. Um, and these can be delayed until after the postponement period. Now, this decision making is made based on consensus between the radiologist and the ordering clinician. Time sensitive cases are cases where a short delay is acceptable within the time frame indicated by the ordering clinician. And critical uh, procedures are those procedures that cannot be delayed. Um, and these procedures should be scheduled right away. Now, Dr. Popescu talked about this uh, uh, precautions. And most cases fall into the droplet contact precaution, and I won't belabor this too much, uh, but here are the precautions to take. And then for airborne contact precautions, these, um, you know, as mentioned, N95 mask is used or PAPR. Um, and I will mention um, N95 masks filter uh, particles that are greater than five micrometers in diameter, while PAPR filter uh, 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 particles that are uh, 0.3 uh, millimeter micrometers or larger. And so theoretically, you know, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 droplets and other coronavirus cop part, uh, droplets can be as small as four micrometers. So there is the theoretical possibility that an N95 mask uh, could be, you know, could potentially not block uh, the, those particles. But with the use of a face shield, that certainly reduces that risk. So it's just something good to keep in mind. Um, and I will mention in terms of our practice and our process, we haven't seen a single case where a, a, a healthcare worker or a patient wearing an N95 mask ended up getting exposed in that setting. Uh, there was a question in regards to what aerosol generating procedures uh, encompass. And for us, it's moderate sedation, intubation, open suction. Um, and, and per the Society of Interventional Radiology guidelines, other procedures that are included are gastrojejunostomy tubes, gastrostomy tube placement, lung ablation, uh, pulmonary or bronchial artery uh, interventions, bronchial or GI stents, as well as lung biopsy, thoracentesis, pleural drain, chest tube, nasogastric tube, or orogastric tube placement. In addition, we've included um, other GI procedures, uh, swallow studies, as well as uh, um, uh, barium enemas based on the indication that endoscopies and colonoscopies uh, both fall into the category of potentially aerosol generated. And with uh, colonoscopies, the reason why those fall into this category is because of the fact that virus can be shed uh, within uh, fecal material. So in terms of imaging in COVID-19, uh, we uh, uh, work to direct ambulatory imaging of symptomatic patients to institutions with lower foot traffic and less critically ill patients. This includes outpatient imaging centers, as well as isolated scanners with easier access from the outside within our hospital systems. We perform portable imaging when possible, as we mentioned. Um, and this applies for inpatients. We image uh, through the glass. This helps to conserve uh, personal protective equipment, and it also limits technologist exposure. And we've been able to perform this imaging through standard glass, through uh, mesh wire reinforced glass, as well as through metal Venetian, metal Venetian blind uh, shielded glass. And we are able to obtain adequate imaging. And here's an example with the uh, imaging unit set up outside the room. Uh, the technologist puts two bags over the cassette film 
and then through the door hands it to a, a nurse that's in the room with the patient who is uh, fully donned in PPE. Uh, the nurse sets up the film behind the patient and then, and then the nurse stands behind a uh, lead uh, shielded wall while the imaging is performed. Subsequently, the nurse brings the film back to the door and hands the cassette and the inner bag only while keeping the outer bag within the room, which is then disposed of. The technologist cleans the outer bag and cleans the cassette after that. And here's just one of those radiographs obtained through the wire mesh glass. You can see there's uh, pretty good image quality in this, in this uh, film acquisition. In terms of room cleanup, Dr. Popescu uh, discussed this. And just to provide um, uh, our approach, we use quaternary ammonium alcohol impregnated wipes or other EPA approved disinfectants. There's a list of these with about 280 different disinfectants on the uh, EPA website. There's no need for room closure if there's sufficient air exchange for droplet precaution. Um, and air exchange really depends on a number of factors. It depends on uh, room size, room ventilation, uh, uh, whether the, and, and air circulation within that room. For airborne precaution, we use the similar wipes for room cleaning. And we close the room for one hour if there's greater than six, hour, six air exchanges per hour. If it's a lot more than six air exchanges, you can close it for less than an hour. If there's less than six air exchanges, you probably need to close it for longer than an hour. And HEPA filtration, and as Dr. Popesco mentioned, uh, negative pressure rooms uh, can certainly accelerate that room turnover. And here's just a graphic from the CDC website showing the air exchanges per hour and the length of time it takes to clean 99% and 99.9% .9 of the room air. And you can see right at that six hour mark, you're below an hour for 99% efficiency and close to an hour for 99.9 .9 efficiency. With less air exchanges per hour, you would have to have longer room closures. And with uh, increased air exchanges, you would certainly need shorter room closures. So in summary, Imaging is not the front line for COVID-19 screening. However, it can be used in surge environment when limited PCR testing, uh, patients at risk for disease progression and those with clinical deterioration. Imaging should be performed in COVID positive and suspected patients uh, based on symptoms, suspicion for alternative diagnoses or overlap of symptoms and determination for elective imaging postponement can depend on consensus between patients and ordering physicians. Appropriate precautions for healthcare workers and appropriate protections are necessary uh, in addition to protections for patients. Thank you. And next is uh, Dhruv Chopra. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mosabashra. So as you mentioned, you know, the world of radiology is completely changed today. Uh, elective procedures are being delayed um, and this is creating ramifications on the business side so practices continue to exist. Um, and so I wanted to go through that uh, process with you and share with you what the new world of radiology is going to look like. And as far as disclosures go, I have none. Um, we started collaborative imaging um, about two years ago with the sole purpose of providing solutions to radiology practices so they can continue to exist and retain their independence. So as you can imagine, this hit home to us because a lot of radiology practices were falling apart, did not make ends meet any longer, and as a result, we have to do something um, to help them. And I'm pleased to say that most of our practices, if not all, are withering the storm as best as possible. Um, but it's required a lot of changes um, to their practice. And um, I wanted to review that with you so we can learn from that as well. Um, today, what I'm going to review with you contains volumes of studies of about 9 million annually. Uh, we have about 500 radiologists on our platform. We see about 7 million patients annually. We have about 60 hospital partners throughout the country. Um, and we have a technology um, division, which is very big. And you'll see that throughout this presentation that, you know, we rely heavily on technology to solve problems and on our data scientists to identify what exactly is going on and what that actually means. Uh, we have to be an evidence-based uh, decision-making company to help our practices succeed. So the economic impact of COVID-19 on healthcare is kind of ironic that it's a healthcare problem and we have healthcare 
at the front line um, trying to defend us from this problem. Yet it's the healthcare uh, community that's really taking a hit financially, as well as you know physically with being on the front line. So a couple of highlights, uh, elective non-urgent procedures have been canceled or delayed. Um, hospital utilization has dramatically dropped with occupancy falling over 15% compared to the same time last year. Operating room minutes are down by over 20%, which means there are less surgeries happening in the hospitals, less procedures happening. Um, overall, this has resulted in hospital revenues dipping by over 60%, which is why we're seeing so many hospitals today declare bankruptcy or shutter, shutter their doors um, and not be able to exist. This has had a tremendous impact on imaging as well. Um, imaging utilization has dropped significantly since March 1 compared to where it was. Um, outpatient utilization has dropped by over 65% due to the lockdowns and cancellation of elective procedures. These practices that provide services and have been providing services still have the physicians, still have the overhead, but they just don't have the volume coming in um, to be able to you know, practice um, like they were previously. So on radiology practices specifically, our outpatient centers have been hit severely um, with utilization decline. Um, this has resulted in significant revenue losses um, because they still have to pay for their equipment, they have to pay for rent, the clinical and administrative staff, but again, there's no volume coming in. Radiology practices, in turn, have also suffered because now they don't have professional interpretations to provide um, since there is utilization that's gone down uh, significantly. And if you think about it, a typical healthcare practice has days in AR or receivable of about 45 days. So that means that in 45 days after the onset of decline, their cash is going to start you know, drastically declining. And that's what we're seeing today with a lot of practices. Um, I was just reading in the news yet day before yesterday that a 500-man physician group just shut their doors after being around for 30-some years. It's unheard of. It's an unprecedented time. And we at Collaborative Imaging want to make sure we do our part to help these practices continue to exist. So if we look at the place of service changes as to what's happened in the industry since COVID came about, you can see at the top chart, there is a dip in volume. But what's happened is the ER volume has stayed pretty consistent. Inpatient volume has actually increased and represents more of the entire patient mix. And the outpatient, which is the brown, has gone down dramatically. So what we're seeing is that patients who are coming into the hospital are actually staying longer now, but overall volume has gone down. If you look at the bottom chart, you can see the volume decline has been of over 40%, close to 50% as from March 1 to present, uh, which practices we're dealing with today. If we look at what this means on our aggregate volume, we're basically saying that 40% of the outpatient volume, 48% of the outpatient volume has been shifted um, since March 1 to present. How much of that volume is actually going to come back is yet to be determined. If you look at the inpatient volume, it's down by about 22% in aggregate. Again, how many of those patients are actually going to come back as inpatients? We don't know. And then if you look at the emergency room, we have seen the volume drop by 30% in total. Again, those patients who did not come into the emergency room, who used to come into the emergency room, are likely not going to come into that emergency room now because the emergency has either been taken care of or they've found other services. Well, that's going to be revenue loss for our imaging centers, for our hospitals, and of course for the physicians who are treating, the radiologists who are um, reading those exams. If you look at the bottom left chart, you can see the breakout as to what is happening with the inpatient emergency and outpatient. You can see the outpatient dip is roughly 80%, which is what we would expect. Uh, we have started to see a little pickup in volume recently but it's nowhere near um, where it needs to be. If you look at it by modality on the third chart on the bottom right, you can see mammograms are the ones that have taken the biggest hit. And these are mammogram screening studies that patients are deferring or delaying as a whole. Interestingly, you can see CTs have started to rise um, since, since April 18th to April 24th. We have seen a pickup in the CT volume, but everything else is still not really increasing um, over time. As far as pyramix goes, this is another determinant of how much money is actually going to come in for the practices. You can see the red line represents self-pay. These are true self-pay patients who do not have insurance. That self-pay has increased from less than 20%, about 18%, to about 27%. That's a 10% increase that we're seeing right now in the self-pay population that's coming into the hospital. 
A lot of this is because people have lost their jobs, people are unemployed, and they don't have the insurance benefits right now. But that's also going to change the revenue aspect of things as far as the practice goes. Similarly, you can see the gray line represents the commercial insurance carriers. That's typically the insurance carriers that pay higher than Medicare, higher than self-pay. But you can see that volume dipping, and it's gone from a steady state of 30 to about 22 23%. And what that again means is your commercial patients are not coming in, and they're being converted to self-pay patients, which means even though you're seeing the volume of patients you know, relatively improve, it's actually a very different payer mix. So what that means is the money that's going to come in is going to be much lower. We also see with the blue line that Blue Cross Blue Shield has continued to decline um, over time. The Blue Cross Blue Shield patients are not coming in as, in as much of a wave as they were and as much of a ratio that they've made up previously. So what does this mean for radiology? It means that revenues are going to dip drastically. We're seeing practices go out of business. We're seeing practices trying to sell um, to other groups. We're seeing independence of these practices at stake now. Um, the remaining volume, again, just because volume has gone down by 20% or 30%, doesn't mean that revenue has gone down by 30%. It actually means revenue has gone down by a significantly larger percentage because the payer mix has changed and the, payer and the modality mix has changed so much that 30% of volume could represent 60% of revenue. A lot of the hospital-based practices are not likely to realize the utilization um, that's gone, that's foregone um, at the outpatient centers and not at the ER either. So what that means is that revenue is lost forever. It's not like it's going to come back and it's like, you know, it's been in queue that all of a sudden all these patients are going to come back in. There's going to be a significant portion of that that's going to be lost. And the only way practices can, you know, solve this problem is really to focus on cost reductions and improve their efficiencies so that they can continue to exist. Some, some of the strategies that groups have used around the country, um, again, these are temporary strategies, but, you know, you don't hear yourself ever saying that healthcare groups are going to be furloughing physicians or furloughing their employees. But we've seen a lot of furloughing happen. We've seen elimination of part-time physicians. We've seen reduction of salaries of physicians. We have seen physicians being offered additional vacation time, so they don't work five days a week. They just work three days a week and only get paid for three days a week. We have seen partners who founded the companies who you know, worked their way up to become a partner in the physician practices are getting paid nothing or reduced salaries. Um, the CARES Act has been you know, a savior in many ways. Um, credit lines have been, you know, people are exhausting credit lines as much as possible. But the reality is banks don't want to give credit lines and don't want to extend credit lines to groups when they see the decline in volume because their concern is this group ever going to see the money come in again. Again, these are temporary fixes that groups have been taking and undertaking, but the reality is that they have to become more efficient and they have to adapt and change in order to make it through um, this COVID um, pandemic. Some of the other strategies that we've seen groups use is deferring payments to major cost centers. So they identify what their biggest cost centers are, and they say, well, can we pay you, you know, in two months or in three months, as opposed to now? Um, refinancing loans. Um, you know, we've been able to reduce costs for our practices. You know, we consistently see that we can take down costs by 30%. So there is this room that you can join practices and you can help them reduce their costs so they can still continue to survive um, in the same book of business that they have and, you know, be able to make ends meet. Revenue cycle is another one, you know, that we focus very, very, very deeply and strongly on. And we've been able to see where we can improve revenue on 25% on that book of business. So this is the time that one needs to focus on their costs, one needs to focus on revenue cycle, one needs to focus on the efficiencies. The CARES Act that came about on March 27th um, was a big savior. Um, it provided the Paycheck Protection Program. And basically it said, as long as you keep your employees on your payroll, the government's going to give you eight weeks of payroll to make ends meet. You can use that money for payroll, rent, mortgage, interest, or utilities. Um, again, that's eight weeks. This is going to last longer than eight weeks. So we need to see where we're going to be um, after this eight weeks period is over. Accelerated Medicare payments. Uh, Medicare CMS issued a proclamation that you can apply for an advance of Medicare payments. Um, it would basically be two to three months of Medicare payments. Um, that you would have got based upon, you know, November, December, January timeframes, and they would extend that to you. However, that payment's due starting in November, and you have to pay it back, um, you know, to Medicare starting in November. So you have 120 days where you get this accelerated payment to you, 
but then they're going to start taking that money back. So it's a loan of many kinds. It's a zero interest loan, and Medicare is going to recoup that money over time. And then we have the Provider Relief Fund, uh, which came about where they have $30 billion distributed through billing companies, which started on April 10th. A lot of groups have taken advantage of that. There's a second round of $20 billion that's going around as well, um, but they're putting a few more stipulations on that. So from an auditing perspective, groups have to be willing to audit. But all of this is, again, a temporary Band-Aid to fix the underlying issue because this money is going to get spent very quickly um, with practices continuing to keep their doors open when volume's not coming in. So what should the outpatient imaging centers do? Um, you know, once things open up, and in Texas, we've now opened up the state, um, and elective procedures are allowed to happen. So the outpatients should start reaching out to their referring physicians and publicize openings. They should encourage radiologists to provide contrast coverage using virtual solutions. Um, CMS relaxed the rules as to having a radiologist or a physician on site at imaging centers to where they can cover virtually. So they should use that so that they don't have to put radiologists in the risk um, in harm's way uh, by any means. Um, identify patients who have been scheduled for mammals that did not come in for mammals and try and get those patients to come back, talk to those patients, show them that you've taken the precautionary measures that they can come back in and they can do their mammal uh, screening studies. Partner with hospital systems who cannot provide the services within their hospital and they want to move the patients to an outpatient center. Set up partnerships, alliances with those hospitals so you can get that volume coming to you. Consolidate schedules between centers to allow center utilization to be maximized. Today, you have centers which have 20, 30 centers strong in different parts of the city. Well, maybe you need to condense that. Maybe you say, well, let's not open up all 30 centers. Let's just open up 15. And let's you know, maximize our schedule so we don't have additional staffage or additional costs associated with operating different centers when patients can come an extra two miles um, to, meet, to meet their care needs. Monitor developments around prior authorization moratorium. So prior authorizations is a very cumbersome process. It's very inefficient. Um, we're talking with the ACR to try and get those um, requirements relaxed. So let's monitor those. And as soon as we can get that re relaxation done, let's make sure that we reach out to patients and get those patients in and reallocate our staff so they don't have to focus on the prior authorizations. And then utilize pre-registration solutions and scheduling solutions to facilitate workflow. Let the patients schedule themselves, let the patients pre-register themselves, let them go through that process so they're in control of their patient care all the way through, as opposed to coming into the imaging centers and accumulating over there and standing around filling out forms. Let's get that done before the patient even comes in. So how should radiology practices survive now? Um, the first thing is, you know, there is this thought that there's going to be this surge that's going to be coming, that eventually a lot more patients will start coming in through the imaging centers as this Lockdowns get lifted and people get more comfortable. So how do these radiology practices that have you know, cut out part-time employees, that have reduced physician salaries, that have given them more vacation, how is that, how do they cope with the surge that's coming in? Well, first thing you have to do is eliminate the inefficiencies in the process. We need radiologists to focus on interpreting studies and not performing administrative functions. We have a universal work list that we have developed um, right now. And if you look at the right-hand side, the top shows what a typical radiologist would look at. And if you can imagine, they have 60 different hospital systems. They would have about 60 different monitors sitting over there with radiologists swiveling around on their chairs from one monitor to the next, look at the work list and see what needs to be read. Well, today we've consolidated all of that into one universal work list. So our doctors are being able to read off one universal work list for 60 disparate hospital systems. And now all of a sudden the work list is complete. We can push studies to the appropriate subspecialist to provide subspecialist reads. We have physicians working from home, so physicians can provide the services even when they're not um, in the hospital setting. The relationship between referring physicians and physician and radiologists has evolved to whereby now they're using technology to communicate with each other as opposed to walking in the reading rooms and talking with those um, radiologists. Um, they're using video conferencing to an bigger extent. And then with the utilization, you know, utilize this technology to provide neighboring states coverage as well where they need it, because licensure requirements by CMS have been reduced to almost none. So now physicians can cross state lines and provide services across state lines. So let's use our radiologists to provide that coverage as well um, once we have these efficiencies realized. We also think we should change the reimbursement structure to encourage bonus payments for reads above the norm 
while maintaining quality and safety metrics. Today, a radiologist can get paid a salary, and that's what, whether they read 50 RBUs or whether they read 70 RBUs, that's what they get. Well, let's put some sort of incentive in place for radiologists to go above and beyond if they need to. Radiology has changed forever. There's no two ways about it. Um, you know, we have worked very closely with our hospital systems for a long time to try and get radiologists out of the hospital to allow them to be reading remotely. And hospitals have basically said, no, we want the radiologists on site. Referring physicians have said, no, we want them on, on site. But today with COVID-19, they've, they've opened up their thoughts and they've allowed radiologists to be remote. And that's not something that's gonna change now. So we have a lot of radiologists today reading remote. We have staggered shifts in the hospital. We don't have multiple physicians at the hospital at the same time, unless it's an IR doc along with a radiologist, but they keep apart. Um, so that's going to continue. We're being able to provide a lot more subspecialty reads because we have radiologists all over the country working off one work list. So depending on the subspecialty, we can push studies to that particular physician so they can provide the reads. The referring physician and radiologist communication has completely evolved where they're using technology um, as opposed to, you know, picking up the phone and calling each other or walking um, down the halls to talk to each other. Um, they're going to have virtual consults with physicians and radiologists as opposed to what was happening previously. Again, the staggered shifts will probably continue. Um, reads will be rendered regardless of state boundaries, locations of physicians. We have doctors reading uh, today from North Carolina, reading for Texas, Texas reading for North Carolina and vice versa. And then the compensation models are going to evolve um, and product to ensure that there is productivity and quality as opposed to being 100% salary. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Drew, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, so now we wanted to discuss um, uh, quickly uh, just um, uh, a discussion about what the future may entail uh, based on our experiences um, and I do want, I think you touched on a number of them, Drew, but I think one thing is, is that we do face an issue of continued patient and health care worker concerns that may limit immediate rescheduling. As you mentioned, there's, there's the concern for a potential surge, um, but at the same time, there are those concerns that exist, and we need to ensure that we provide all the uh, precautions in place to prevent undoing what we've already done, and as well as to restore those patient, the patient confidence in our ability to protect them. Um, and you mentioned outpatient imaging uh, uh, centers as, as potential avenues that will have increased volume because of those concerns. Uh, but it's a topic we, you know, uh, if you guys have any thoughts on, we can discuss. Yeah, I think it's a tough. I think it's a tough situation, and you're absolutely right. You know, of course, number one, you want to make sure we don't reverse all the hard work and the good work that's been done so far. Um, on the other hand, you also have this balancing act where you want to make sure that you know patient care can continue to be delivered, and these businesses can continue to exist as well. Um, I think right now what we're doing with the imaging centers as a whole is limiting the number of patients, spreading them out over time, making sure we have the safety precautions in place. Uh, from start to finish, checking patient temperature before they even walk in the door, making sure they don't have a fever, making sure they don't have any signs or symptoms, even though that's, you know, very often it's asymptomatic. However, you know, we're trying to put the right processes in place, um, but it's something that I think we just need to figure out, you know, as a community as to how we're going to continue um, to exist um, and provide the services. And, uh, you know, Saskia, I would love to hear from you as to what you think, you know, and what your thoughts are as to, you know, how could imaging centers get back open and provide the services while maintaining everything that you've discussed in your presentation? I think that's a good question. I think, unfortunately, um, in infection prevention, traditionally, we've always been focused on inpatient. So outpatient um, often doesn't get the attention it deserves. And unless you're part of a very large hospital system where you have an infection preventionist who might be dedicated to outpatient services, um, it's, it's kind of a do the best you can. And I think now would be the time to really work with the infection control staff you have to try and ensure that guidance is, is you know, your needs are being met. A big piece of this is, are you doing screening for your patients coming in? Um, do you have masks available for 
any visitors or um, patients that are coming in? Do you have signage that's out there really asking them? Or when you're calling about appointments, are you really reminding them, you know, please don't come in if you're sick or are you doing screening then? So there's all these um, very proactive ways that I think we can incorporate that. I also find that traditionally, um, you know, outpatient staff don't always feel the most comfortable with personal protective equipment. Of course, you know, that's variable, but spending time really making sure they feel comfortable with eye protection and how to wipe that down and reuse that or, or how to put on an N95 because it's vastly different than a surgical mask. So if you have infection control resources, I see lean on them for sure. But if not, really look at the flow of, of a patient through that area and what the vulnerable points might be. Wonderful. Thank you so much for both of you uh, for those responses. Um, before we continue on to our Q&A session, we would like to recognize Barco for sponsoring tonight's webinar. Barco Diagnostic Display Systems are engineered to deliver higher clinical outcomes, increased productivity, and full clean ability for infection control. Manage your remote reading stations with QA Web for automated quality assurance and DICOM compliance. Contact Barco for more information on why your diagnostic display should have a protective cover. Okay, so we are ready to jump to the Q&A uh, 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 session and your questions. Before we get started, I would like to remind our audience how to submit. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. And it looks like we have a number of questions that have already come through. Uh, starting from the top, to what degree does office department layout affect infection control and prevention? Um, and and uh, uh, Dr. Popescu, if you want to field that question. Yeah, I mean, I think the key piece right now is can people maintain social distancing? And if you have an office environment that is, you know, you're all very closely packed for a prolonged period of time in a closed space that is obviously a very challenging area to maintain infection control and you know just um, general safety cough etiquette things like that so i would encourage you if you have a, a close or a small office space with a lot of people working in close contact with each other try to maybe stagger that can you have 50 percent capacity in that space what are you doing for high touch surface disinfection and cleaning I always tell people, you know, when you come into a workspace, that's your time to wipe it down. And as you're leaving, do it again. Do you have access to hand sanitizer in there and other hand hygiene um, avenues like a sink, you know, soap and water? So I, I really look at a couple of things. How many people are in that space? How close together are they and for how long? And of course, mat wearing masks can help reduce the possibility of transmission, but it's not the only route. So we need to make sure that we're considering the other places. So in those office spaces, try to minimize the amount of people that are in close quarters for a prolonged period of time. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and the second question, uh, discusses the idea from a JAMA viewpoint paper that face shields are superior to PPE, uh, are superior PPE to face masks. And the question is, should we be using uh, face shields uh, for PPE and radiology? And Dr. Pulescu, that's probably down your avenue as well. <laughs> Um, I, I really do love face shields. I think that this might be the direction we're moving into in the future. Unfortunately, we need more data to support that. So I'm hesitant, of course, to always say, let's make a huge shift in PPE without a lot of studies and research behind it. I think that it really begs a good question of how we've approached PPE traditionally, which is wear a mask. And now that we're really can focusing on your eyes, in your nose potential areas because unfortunately I do see a lot of people who wear masks under their nose which always breaks my heart a little bit um, but eyes are of course a portal of entry so uh, that question is really now coming up more and more commonly so right now I wouldn't say totally give up your masks and only wear a face shield don't do that <laughs> um, but we want to start evaluating this process in the future so Face shields are my preferred um, cover for your eyes because they cover your mask as well and just your face. If you don't have access to them, of course, goggles are fine, but you still wanna be wearing that respiratory protection because we're still learning a lot. And hopefully in the future, we can move to a new model of protection, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And the que next question is what is considered aerosol generating? And we touched on this um, in the presentation, but just to go over it again, 
uh, anything, any procedure in radiology that requires moderate sedation, in our group we've generalized that to mineral, minimal sedation as well, because minimal sedation can convert to moderate sedation. Any time where there's the possibility that a patient can become intubated, um, or if they're already intubated because of the risk of potential self-extubation, or disconnection from the, from the system that can result in aerosol generation, uh, any patient that's having open, open suction, uh, as we mentioned, gastrojejunostomy, G-tube uh, placement, lung ablation, pulmonary art, bronchial artery interventions, bronchial or GI stents, lung biopsy, thoracentesis, pleural drains, chest tube, NG or OG tube placement. And we also have included any upper GI or lower GI uh, procedures as well. The next question is, as imaging begins to open back up and more providers are needed in-house, how do you plan to maximize their safety while meeting imaging needs and requirements? Um, and I, I think we could all field this question. I, I'll mention um, in terms of our approach, we've staggered uh, radiologists. We, may, we have a universal masking uh, process now where all, uh, all patients and employees entering the hospital have to be wearing a mask. Um, we, uh, we practice maximal uh, social distancing uh, in our reading rooms where we've implemented uh, a, a process where uh, physicians have to be every other workstation apart. Um, and we've implemented uh, reduced teams where there's a, a faculty, a fellow, and a resident uh, that works in the reading room together at any given time. And we actually create these core teams that exclusively work together so that if there is an exposure within one of these teams, they don't cross-contaminate other teams. Everything is virtual right now um, as well. Um, do you guys have any, any, uh, anything you want to talk about in terms of your approaches or your thoughts on how to reduce exposures? Yeah, I think we've done, much the, same. <laughs> we've done much the same in the hospital setting. And then we just have more physicians reading from home um, and using virtual technology as much as possible, again, to cover contrast and just limiting you know, their exposure. Um, so. I think also Wonderful. really encouraging people to come forward if they do have symptoms um, or are test positive. I know that transparency and trust is a big piece of this too. So it really needs to be kind of like a no fault environment so that if you know you do, if you have a spouse at home who ends up having it, how are you handling that situation? And are you in encouraging people to come forward and say, you know what, I'm not feeling that well. It's time for me to go home, or I tested positive this weekend. Those kinds of things. I've just, I've, I think that piece to it is a is a huge aspect of infection control. Okay, wonderful. Um, and the next question is for Dr. Dr. Popescu as well. It's from an outpatient imaging patient, uh, uh, center that's starting to image non-COVID patients. Uh, what PPE does our staff need? Uh, they have been reserving N95s for contact with PUIs, uh, but they're wondering, do they need to do additional cleaning uh, of equipment after imaging asymptomatic patients? I say, you know, treat it as you normally would. Make sure your cleaning products are still effective against SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, and realistically, I know that a lot of hospitals and states are moving to a pre-screening for periop. And I think, um, you know, depending on the environment you work on or work in, especially if, if you want to have a everybody that comes in wears a mask policy, I think that's good for your staff if they want to wear. And I encourage people just to be wearing a mask throughout the day. I think everybody in healthcare is at this point. But beyond that, if they're asymptomatic, you know, there's really not a lot you can do except for really encourage people to use hand hygiene when they come in, really encourage mask wearing for, for patients and visitors and for staff, obviously, to be wearing a mask. Um, you know, that, that kind of two-way protection is really important. And it, I think it's a good role model, too, for, for patients um, if they see healthcare workers wearing masks. So, you know, beyond that, you have to work with what you have. And if you don't have a person in there who's having any obvious symptoms, they might not have COVID-19. So how would you normally handle this? And of course, you are going to be having people who might have COVID-19 and might have really mild symptoms we don't realize. So that's why those basic infection control measures are so important, that hand hygiene, you know, disinfection, um, and then really if your staff can wear masks. If, and if you really want to go above and beyond, of course, goggles are always helpful, but they're not going to be 
in that really, um, as I would consider a very high risk process or environment. You know, when we look at exposures, it's really who wore PPE and the mask is the biggest piece to that. So I think mask usage becomes, you know, that much more critical. Okay, and for the last question, I want I want to ask uh, Mr. Chopra this. Um, the question is, how does taking? Or uh, sorry, do you see different outpatient drops based on imaging modality? Any differences from one to another? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest drop that we've seen is in mammogram uh, for sure. Uh, we've you know it's, that's really where the elective procedures came in. That's where they stopped. We've also seen drip, uh, drops in MRIs. Uh, ultrasound, surprisingly, you know, is started to drop now, and I think it's just because of the infectious control um, regulations and you know recommendations as to avoid ultrasound if possible um, is what we're telling the imaging centers right now. Just because there's more patient um, patient clinician um, interaction at that particular point. Um, but definitely mammals, uh, mammogram, mammograms, screening mammograms is definitely where we saw the biggest hit, the biggest impact. Okay, wonderful. So I, I've been given the uh, okay to take a few more questions. Um, so the next question is, are there any thoughts on installing disinfecting type UV lighting or UV air recirculating devices in imaging suites to accelerate pathogen kill during uh, periods between patients? This is probably a Dr. Popescu question. Um, I think the biggest piece for UV disinfection is using it as kind of like a post-patient care cleaning, an enhanced cleaning, meaning it's not going to um, suddenly mean you don't have to clean and disinfect things. It's a supplemental aspect. And I really encourage people when they're evaluating, look at the literature in the company. There's a lot of companies suddenly coming forward with cleaning and disinfection protocols for COVID-19 that aren't necessarily actually meeting the mark for that. So do your research. And if you're going to use um, UV disinfection, be, you know, be mindful of the environment that you're using it in and how much surface, you know, what time does it need? Can you just turn on the, what kind of lamp or, you know, all of those things. Anytime I see a video of somebody just kind of swooping over something with it, I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't think that was enough time to actually kill anything. So just do your research on the company, look at the peer reviewed studies that they offer, um, ask questions and, you know, keep in mind that again, this is not something that you can suddenly have to, um, that doesn't, it doesn't get you out of your cleaning and disinfection at the end of the day. This is just an enhanced way of doing it and adding to it really. Wonderful. Uh, so the next question is about uh, taking uh, radiographs through the glass and whether having glass leaded windows uh, affects that. And we've actually seen no effect on image quality uh, with any of these windows. We, we, um, we have even uh, employed this through uh, windows with uh, metal Venetian blinds where if you open the blinds, you know, the density of the metal that you're imaging is thicker so you see linear lines on it. But if you close the, those blinds and there's a sheet of metal uh, behind the window and you can't actually see through the window because of that sheet of metal, uh, the exposure actually turns out really good because the metal that you're imaging through is very thin. So I anticipate there wouldn't be much issue with the leaded glass, especially if it's a transparent window. Uh, it, 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 I, I don't believe it should be an issue. Uh, we answered that question. In your opinion, is it safe for students to return to the clinical setting? What precautions are or should be taken. Um, and I, I think I could probably field that question. In terms of uh, um, medical students returning, I think uh, st you know, it's, it's really dependent on the local ordinances and the, and the government uh, and, and, and the local government uh, rulings and mandates in your area. I think once the stay at home orders are lifted, I think it's, it's certainly feasible to have medical students and other students return uh, but as of right now, I think it's probably, depending on your, your local uh, process and your institutional uh, rules, probably better for them uh, to stay away if the rules indicate as such. Uh, the next question is for Mr. Chopra. Is there a clear point to return to financial normalcy? At what point do you undo furloughs and bring your part-time providers back? Yeah, that's, um, that's, a tough, that's a tough question. And, you know, we're in a tough situation. Um, the reality of it is we don't know if there's going to be another peak 
um, you know, a second wave coming. And I think the physician community that we've been interacting with so far has been, you know, they get it. They understand the situation and they're part of the situation. They're realizing that, okay, if revenues have gone down by so much, then we have to, you know, take a hit ourselves. Um, I would not, I would not be too quick to pull the trigger. Um, I think groups should also use this as an opportunity to just redefine themselves as a practice to see where are the inefficiencies and, you know, have the physicians, you know, be as efficient and change their technology and evolve to get to the next level, given the leeway that they have now from the hospitals, where hospitals are willing to let physicians read outside their premises. So, you know, as difficult as it is, um, and as quickly as, you know, we want to get everybody back in, the last thing we want to do is bring them back in just to have them for a load again. And so it's a tricky, it's a tricky, tricky situation from that perspective. Well, we have uh, run out of time, unfortunately. I want to thank the audience for attending and for participating in tonight's event. I also want to thank all our wonderful speakers uh, for uh, giving us their time uh, to talk to us and share their wisdom and knowledge and experience. I would also like to thank Diagnostic Imaging and Infection Control today for making tonight's webcast possible. Thanks to all for joining. We'll see you next time. Good night. All right. Thank you.